Welcome to Delling Pole, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pole. Welcome to the Delling Pole podcast with me, James Delling Pole, and my very special guest, Simon Corkwell. Now, Simon, let me let me describe him. He's sitting in front of me, and it's sort of mid-morning, and he's still dressed in his pajamas. And he didn't go to university. He couldn't. Why did you not go to university? Someone you were too Be- thick. Because the first question I put to the admissions tutor at Trinity Hall, Cambridge, was, "How far are we from Newmarket?" And this gentleman, if such he was took the view that I was not entirely serious about the work in hand. What I forbore to tell him, after all I didn't know, was that I wanted to read economics, uh, because that was a subject that has greatly interested me all my working life, and it still does. And the fact is, I would have failed if I had tried to succeed with economics at university. Yeah, there was a lesson here, I think, for all of us, because I did, of course, go to the other university uh, than the, the one that you, you applied for. And here I am. So, I mean, people, people complain about the fact that I'm always whinging about my job. But the fact is that you are, you, Simon Corkwell, yes. are much, much richer than I am. I am a struggling hack. I have a certain degree of sort of semi-fame. Yes. But you... Have a life in which you sit in your lovely London flat yes. and you stare at screens all day yes. and you make lots of money yes. out of stock markets and stuff. Yes, that is true. No, so I'm driven by greed and curiosity. Yeah. Now, you, let me, let me um, describe further uh, who you are. You operate under the handle Evil Knievel. Now... I don't think you ever jumped on a motorcycle across the Grand Canyon. That's true. In I'd a, be a, prosecuted for cruelty to motorcycles <laughs> were I to engage in that. Indeed, uh, Evil Knievel is, of course, suggestive of the canyon-jumping American of 30 years ago. Hmm. And uh, his, his name is slightly differently spelt to avoid my having to sue him for... Uh, breach of uh, whatever law it is I might dream up he, is in, he was in breach of. Um, and uh, his view was that uh, if you want to catch the public's imagination, you go jumping canyons. Yeah. I'm afraid that has never been my option in life. And as a result, I've just had to be plain evil Knievel, as in live, live ink backwards. So... I should tell you that we have, listening to this podcast, is a very special listener who is, who is my special friend. And although I know and love this listener dearly, at the same time, I'm never quite sure about this, this listener's degree of understanding or interest in the complexities of, say, on this occasion, stock markets. Yeah. So I know that you're a, a shorting specialist. Yes. And I kind of know what shorting is because I dabble in that world very badly but I, I do I'm interested in it because I, I, I kind of want to be you but maybe you could just explain what a short trader is what what he does a short trader is a chap with a black heart and he, yeah. and he borrows stock and sells it to the market and his expectation is that after he sold it to the market he will be able subsequently to buy it back at a price which is lower than that at which he sold it. Sometimes, of course, it doesn't work out that way, but that's the game. So you're kind of, you are the vultures of the stock market. You're feeding on, you're feeding on carrion in a way. Yes, we definitely are. We are the dashers of human hopes. I bet if we'd gone to if we'd gone to the Labour cons- uh, conference recently, yes. and I'll bet if people discovered that, that you were a short seller, they'd yeah. have gone, this is exactly what's wrong with capitalism. <laughs> I, I do remember in the aftermath of the 2008 crash, yes. quite a lot of governments briefly banned short selling, I think. Well, Gordon Brown, Gordon Brown who I have always, whom I have always regarded as an ace shyster, yeah. took it into his head 
that uh, if the people don't like short selling, he would have to describe it as disgraceful. Whereas, of course, short selling is merely an expression of opinion in markets. Yeah. And uh, for a while, he made it very difficult to sell short various stocks, particularly those which came in the financial sector, banks and so on. Of course, in due course, the, the banks just fell apart. And in the end, the taxpayer, the poor old taxpayer, through their chums or agency at HM Treasury, had to fill up the gap. Yeah. I, I mean, I, d I don't even know how it can be legal to, to ban short, short selling. Because after all, if, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, if a company mm. is grotesquely overvalued, yes. and, the, and therefore its, its, its price in the market is higher than it should be, yes. why should people be punished for speculating with effectively their own money? Because you can lose money big time on oh, short. Of course you can. Why should, why should these people be punished for sending out a signal saying, hello, this yeah. company's overvalued, uh, Yes, I think it should go down. What, yeah. How is that any, it, any worse than actually betting it, on a price to go up? It's because the vast majority of investors are cowards and whingers, and uh, each one of these investors has a vote. And as a result, a shyster like Gordon Brown yeah. thinks it's a very good idea to respond to basic fears and an inability to control oneself as long as he gets a vote. What, he, what he's doing, in other words, he, he's playing on the fact that most people don't really understand what stock markets are about, how they work. Is that, would, that, would that be fair? Yes, that is true. They don't. Uh, it, it has always seemed to me to be very straightforward. Uh, and I repeat these, this assessment, if you like, because most people don't know it, and they should know it. Basically, a stock market is a place you go to buy and sell your property. That's all it is. And from the point of view of society as a whole, as long as stock market prices are generally high, there will always be the capacity to form new capital, which has the advantage of employment opportunities, profit opportunities, much else besides. And if stock market prices fall below certain levels uh, relating to what is the replacement cost of assets, no capital will be raised. Now, it's for others to judge whether that point has arrived or not arrived. Uh, I myself just take the view that people must decide where stock prices are or should be generally. In, for instance, right at the moment, they are generally far too high, which will end up with a terrible burning of investors' hopes. Yes. I, I, am I not right in thinking that the markets have been so heavily manipulated as a result of central banks money printing for example yes that it is almost impossible to make sensible investment decisions anymore because everything is so distorted yes that's a very serious result of quantitative easing and what the idea that uh, central bankers have got into their head is that they know how the world should work and therefore the world should be bent round to their view well of course that cannot work and in the end, the whole thing will implode. There could be very considerable social consequences. I have a friend who uh, works uh, on economics and the internet at Harvard University. In fact, he's a professor of those subjects. And uh, he was agreeing with me just the other day that it's commonly believed that in America there is never any social unrest through perceived inequity uh, in the distribution of wealth in society. But he agrees with me that the day can come when the Americans could turn pretty violent, uh, as, if, as if they blame others for what has gone wrong in their lives. Well, in this case, it's the central bankers who got it terribly wrong 
And I think, I don't know of course, but I think we will see considerable social consequences, adverse social consequences in America. And I think we'll also see it in Europe as well. Do you, <coughs> where are you on, 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 on Trump? I mean, I, I'm, <coughs> I'm, I'm a, a fan um, because I think that he is a manifestation of a what I see as a healthy impulse, the same impulse we saw during Brexit, yes. where the people are saying there is, there is this... <coughs> I'm sorry. The people are saying that there is this entrenched elite... And Wall Street, for example, and 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 the city have have arranged things in their own interests. They've ignored ignored Main Street, yes. and so Trump is representing, or he he benefited from the vote of the ordinary ordinary guy in in, in probably the middle of America. Yes. Um, at the same time, I wonder how much what. Do you get the impression that he really understands the nature of the problem? I mean, I mean he's got people in in his administration like. Gary Cohn, yes. the ex CEO of Goldman Sachs, of Goldman Sachs, which is is the vampire squid, which is the epicenter <laughs> of all evil, is it? Is it not? I mean, if you if you if you wanted one institution that embodied everything that is wrong with this kind of establishment elite, mm. Goldman Sachs would be it. And yet here is this guy, he's Trump's economic advisor. I don't share your view of Goldman Sachs. I think they just work very hard at understanding what is going on. And anything and everything they do is a consequence of their supreme professionalism. Oh, but my own view of Trump is he is a truly ghastly person. Oh. I, I'm very definitely of the Robert De Niro view that he's a bum and a jerk. And I think this could turn out in practice to be the undoing, not so much of Trump, about whom I care nothing, but the undoing of America. But Hillary, hello? Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, well, Hillary, Hillary would have been worse. Yes, I agree. In so so, so given, given, given that Trump is what we've got, how do we make him... Because I, I'm, I'm more optimistic than you. I just think that, that he's... There's, a, there's a, a red devil on one shoulder <laughs> and a blue angel on the other. Yeah. And... I mean, obviously, I'm a bit biased because because Breitbart, Steve yes. Bannon, I I like Steve. I yes. like what Steve's doing. Yes. Basically, I mean, we I think we disagree on some economic things. I'm yes. I'm not a kind of I don't believe in tariffs, for example. I think yes. I think protectionism is, is is ghastly, and I'm not I'm not totally convinced about economic nationalism. Yeah. But nevertheless, I think he's got the right idea. There is this swamp that needs draining, and if that swamp can be drained, then it'd be a jolly good thing, no? Well, I'm not sure what features of the swamp uh, should be exposed and dealt with by having the swamp drained. Well, the Federal Reserve, for one. I mean, what about... Well, the... you're quite right. There is this great theory that the Federal Reserve is faking the price of gold with a view to keeping the ascendancy of fake money. Do you believe that? Uh, no, because I haven't got any evidence. I think in this life, if you go around... Uh, believing in conspiracy theories. You are a lost man. The fact is, conspiracy theories are all very well uh, on the grounds that you can't disprove them, but equally yeah. you can't prove them. Right. So it's just uh, for children. We're yeah, we, no, actually, I, we, had this, we had this discussion, I think, a couple of podcasts ago with, with, with our friend Dominic Frisbee. And Dominic, too, even, even though he's, he's been a bit of a gold bug in his time, is is not of the view that the the gold price has been uh, manipulated by the Federal Reserve. He just thinks actually, gold is a bit of a, a fuddy duddy substance or of interest to older people. But actually, the kids are much more interested in Bitcoin, and that's and and the Bitcoin is doing the stuff that gold should have done in our imaginations. Well, I think the answer is both will live side by side, in. Uh, giving vent to the opportunities wished for by speculative investors. As regards Bitcoin, I think you touch upon a very interesting point. Uh, when the head of uh, was it J.P. Morgan or Morgan Stanley, I can never distinguish between the two. J.P. Morgan, Morgan, yeah, Mr. Jamie Dimon, yeah. When he said the other day that one day Bitcoin will just collapse, yeah, uh, I. Th 
took that as a buying opportunity. And it would have been it would have been so good, wouldn't it? it was, Absolutely. It was what three three thousand two hundred dollars at the bottom. Yes, and now it's, this morning it's standing at four thousand two hundred dollars, and my view is that you've got to decide yeah. whether you believe that bitcoins can or cannot be printed at will by the promoters of the idea of Bitcoin. If you believe that when they feel they'd like an extra million dollars pocket money, they simply print some more Bitcoins, not too can't. much to disturb the market, but sufficient just to give them some pocket money. Uh, they, uh, if you believe that that is possible, then I agree with Mr. Diamond. The fact is Bitcoins will collapse. However, I have also had it pointed out to me that you can't just go and print bitcoins left, right and centre yep. uh, for various technical reasons which are way beyond me. And that being the case, I think it's an alternative currency, or was cryptocurrency as people insist on calling it, although well, it seems to me to have all the nature, the, 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 the features of the dollar and it's the way people value it. Uh, the fact is, I think that can go a lot higher because there's only 21 million bitcoins in existence as a maximum. I don't think they got up there yet, incidentally. But 21 million bitcoins, yeah. uh, albeit priced at $4,000 a piece, is nothing in terms of the speculative uh, flows going around the world. Furthermore, people say, well, there must be other, and indeed there are, other cryptocurrencies which could unseat bitcoin. But I think Bitcoin has first mover advantage. It's what people think works. And if it works, yes. it'll take on a life of its own. And I should be jolly surprised if we've seen the top for Bitcoin, which I was, I think, about $5,000. Right. Well, it's interesting, that just, just going back to the point you made about when Jamie Dimon made his his sell Bitcoin signal yes. and you saw that as a buy signal. Yes. So say you'd, say you'd bought, you'd probably have bought, rather than buying Bitcoins themselves, you might have traded them on a spread betting site. Yes, you? indeed. And so say you'd bought, as probably you would as a big investor, you traded at £100 a point. Yes. You would have made £100,000 yes. in the space of a week. Yes. Now, there aren't many opportunities anywhere for making £100,000 in the space of a week, are there, on, on just sort of pressing a few buttons? Quite so. And I remind you that as a spread bet, it's free of tax, yeah. which is not unattractive. So I can see why, I, I can see why you're in this, this business. At the same yes. time, I think probably you would have advice to the dear beloved listener that there are certain pitfalls involved in this, aren't there? Of course. All speculation involves risk. And anybody who bets more than they're prepared to lose is a fool. So, I, when I met you um, and proposed doing this podcast to you, um, I said, I hear that you are the greatest shorting legend, that you are Mr. Sh Mister Short. And you said to me, I'm actually not the greatest shorter. There was this chap... Um, a long time ago, and remind me who this chap was and, and his story. Well, uh, he's a chap I've, whose reputation and his life I bumped into later on, but I'm referring to Jesse Livermore, who I think is one of the most interesting characters from American capitalism. Uh, he was born outside Boston on a small holding operated by his father, uh, in 1880, and he clearly uh, got on well at the local school, showing an, a, an, a strong aptitude for mathematics, and which happens to some people. They're just born that way. Bastards. <laughs> why, was, why, why did God bless me with a skill to analyse sodding Shakespeare? I'm, what use is that? Well, that's a matter between you and your God. My I maker, think. yeah. Okay, so yeah. carry on. So <laughs> maths, yes. Yeah. Well, Jesse uh, w w would, if his father had his way, become a smallholder outside Boston. So lesson number one, always ignore your father's career advice. 
<laughs> that may be very good advice. Yeah. But the fact is, his mother gave him some trivial sum, like $10, and said, you're on your way to Boston, see what you can do, which is quite a thought for the circumstances in 1880. Well, by then it was 1895. Anyway, Jesse finds himself in Boston, uh, and he, I expect, made himself useful in hotel lobbies and that sort of thing, and he... Uh, arranged to go and sit in bucket shops, as they were called, uh, to watch the action. And there, the bet was on the tape. Uh, as the tape came through from Wall Street, uh, you could, at the last, you could take a bet either up or down on the last print on the tape. So if United Steel came across as $91 for the sake of argument, you'd pay the man behind the counter a dollar and 12 and a half cents, an eighth of a dollar. And the 12 and a half cents was to stop you uh, out if things went to your disadvantage. But the most you could lose was a dollar. However, you could sit at the back of the bucket shop as the prices went up on the blackboard in front of you, you could have a smoke, no doubt a drink, talk to your mates and all the rest. And uh, if you felt like closing out uh, your interest in United Steel, at any time, you just step up to the counter and say, what's the last printed price in United Steel? And they would say, for the sake of argument, uh, $90. And anyway, Mr. Punter, uh, you've lost your dollar, but you, we've also closed you out because you've hit, you've triggered the stop loss. On the other hand, had our punter stepped across and found that the price was $94, he could close it out immediately at that price and his dollar would magically have become $4. Less, of course, the 12 and a half cents, which the bucket shop kept for itself. Incidentally, these bucket shops, I suppose nowadays we would call them betting shops, were all over America, even in the depths of America. It only required the tape from Wall Street. And uh, it was obviously a big business. Uh, and uh, I must say, I would have found it fascinating. Anyway, whether I did or I did not, or would or would not, Jesse Livermore thought it was fantastic because he was the chap who learnt how to forecast share price movements based on what they had done historically. He kept all these graphs in his mind, and I presume in some sort of little book, and he started to make a lot of money at these bucket, shop, bucket shops. So they, they told him to get out, and he had to go into New York to get cracking, so he's like one of those one of those gamblers who gets banned from casinos for being for being too good. Uh, I'm rather sceptical about tales of gamblers being just chucked out of casinos unless they've been cheating. Because I don't think it's possible to beat the house at casinos, at least not now. It has been in the past, but it isn't now. No, he was uh, chucked out not for cheating. He he was chucked out for being too good. He just knew how to beat the house. And I hugely admire a chap who's worked that out. Yeah, um, we're going to do more in a moment. I'm just realised this is this is we've we've each section is carefully timed to to engage the, the my dear listeners' interest. So you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special guest, Simon Corkwell, aka Evil Knievel. Hey, folks, I want to tell you about Breitbart News Second Amendment newsletter, Downrange with A.W.R. Hawkins. Features the top gun stories of the week and guest columnists like Larry Pratt with Gun Owners of America or Marty Daniel with Daniel Defense. Each week also features the review of a firearm or a firearm accessory, something to make the exercise of your Second Amendment more enjoyable. You can subscribe to the newsletter for free at Breitbart.com backslash Downrange. It'll show up in your inbox every Thursday. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome 
Welcome back to the Dellingpole Podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special guest, Simon Corkwell, aka Evil Knievel, the top short trader. Um, Evil Knievel, Simon, was just telling me the story about Jesse Livermore. So, okay, so we've got to the stage where Jesse Livermore has moved to New York um, and he's got very good at, at trading these ticker tapes. Yes. And, and what happens next? Well, astonishingly, while still a very young man, he started to make really big money in America. And uh, that, I think, is admirable. And furthermore, he got credit from book, uh, not bookmakers, stockbrokers, although I agree there's not much difference. And uh, he turned that credit to advantage. Even when he ran out of money, the brokers would still extend money to him because they trusted him to repay and because they trusted his judgment. There are very, very few people of whom the same may be said. And uh, accordingly, uh, he went on to start making pretty useful money. I think he ran into trouble about 1908 when he would then have been 28 years old. But whatever happened then, what is certain is he started to make really big money, not just out of stocks, but also out of commodities. And by the 20s, he developed an office on Wall Street uh, where he sat at the back to watch all his board men putting up the prices of stocks. This was a, a one-person centric office the only customer, if you like, was himself. And uh, he really made very big money. I'm sure that by today's standards, he'd be regarded as manipulating stocks because he would arrange for stories in the press and so on, some of which may, may have been a bit exaggerated, to cause frenzies in buying and selling. But however you look at it, he won the battle. And I think that's hugely admirable. So uh, we're talking about shorting, aren't we? So presumably he must have called the, the 29 crash. Yes, right. yes, that's absolutely so. He is said to have made $100 million on the collapse of Wall Street. Which, is, which, is, which is probably worth what now? Oh, I don't know. But it'd be, in many senses, at least 10, 20, perhaps 50 times that amount now. That's $5 billion. Yes, well, it depends on what you regard as the cost of living index. Yeah. For instance, I imagine a driver for one's car would be very cheap then by comparison to what it is now, and and so on and so forth. And he made this huge amount of money. Astonishingly, by about 1933 or 1934, he went bankrupt. I don't know why. I suppose he just bought stocks which he thought just had to have bottomed, but far from bottom, bottoming, they just went further south, and in the end that got him. Another feature of Livermore, which has to be understood, was that he suffered by what is um, nowadays known as bipolar, but he was undoubtedly a depressive, and the condition was not understood by medical science then. And there was certainly no medical help towards uh, curing himself of this. Anyway, again, he got out of trouble after 1934. And uh, I'm sorry to say that although he did very well in parts uh, on the run-up to uh, 1940, uh, he persisted with his habit of uh, calling in for a drink at the Sherry Netherlands Hotel uh, on the way back from Wall Street as he walked back to his apartment. And uh, one day, when it all got too much for him, uh, he went into the cloakroom and shot himself. And uh, this was a consequence, I'm sure, of depression. And uh, it, it is said that his wife still was able to scoop up hundreds of thousands of dollars held in cash in their own apartment. So there was something left over for his widow and then rather more. But he was gone. 
I always think, however, that his performance is wholly admirable because he thought for himself from first principles how stock markets work. And there are very few people who can do that in practice. Right. Yes. But ultimately, he ended up topping himself. So, yes. So, and you haven't yet, which I think makes... <laughs> it's a bit late. <laughs> arguably makes you the better, the better <laughs> trader. I want to know yeah. about your, your greatest shorting stories. You must, yeah. you must have some. You must have had some moments where you just thought you had the biggest bollocks on the blog. <laughs> well... I was appreciably younger then, if it doesn't sound a bit sentimental. Mm. But certainly, although I'd had a, a good taste or two of short selling, for instance, I had assaulted Polly Peck to great advantage in mid-1990. That uh, was Azul Nadir? Azul Nadir, yes. Who, who was, was, he, was he a crook? Did he, did oh, he? yes. Yeah. I have no doubt that he was a crook. Okay. But, uh, and, a, and, and an extensive one as well. Yeah. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. I'd made good money out of uh, Azul Nadir and his uh, misdoings, but my real break came on the debagging of Robert Maxwell in October 1990. So Robert Azul. Maxwell was the proprietor of one of Britain's largest tabloid newspapers, the Daily Mirror. Yes. And he was he got an MC in the war, didn't he? Yes. Captain I, Robert Maxwell, uh, MC. I wouldn't be at all surprised to learn that he bought it by bribery. It was the sort of thing he would do. The man was a complete sham. Yeah. And uh, I, he was bombastic and nasty. And essentially, he was pretty brainless as well. Not that he took that view. He thought he was a very intelligent black, which he certainly was not. Anyway, he had cooked up these accounts for Maxwell Communication Corporation. And provided you started reading every line on the basis that it was probably a lie or just possibly a lie, you eventually got to the point where you knew the whole thing was a lie. And uh, I was greatly assisted in this matter by a friend of mine, who's a friend to this day, uh, John Robertson, who is a very clever man. And uh, he and I wrote a note. It ran over four pages uh, explaining the defects in Maxwell's accounts. And uh, there was nothing abusive about it. In fact, it was very mild in tone. But it just concentrated upon facts elicited from the accounts that Maxwell himself had signed. And it was possible to show that insolvency was not a possibility, but a probability, to put it mildly. And I wrote this note by John Robertson and Simon Corkwell. And John pointed out to me pretty emphatically that I did not know anything about securities law. And uh, he was right there. Uh, but I had to take his name out of the authorship. But then I was left with the idea that the note was by me personally, which was alone. And that was would have been an entirely wrong impression to give. So I invented this ridiculous character, Evil Knievel. And I'm pleased to say, because I've had a lot of fun out of it, evil caught on in the city. It's it been a, a good ride, you might say. Yes, it certainly <laughs> has been, yes. Yes. And I've enjoyed it hugely. You've leapt a few canyons. So so presumably you had a short position in Maxwell Group Holdings, whatever yes, they were called. Yes, Maxwell Communication Corporation. Before you issued this note. And presumably yeah. one reason for issuing the note was to move the market. Oh, yes. And is that, is, is that legal? Uh, I think it is, but others may disagree. Right. We okay. don't know. I don't know. So anyway, so you issued this note, and people, by evil can evil, yes. and enough people thought, aye, aye, maybe there's something in this, and yeah. so the price of Maxwell Communications went yes. down. Yes. Did you, did you um, uh, exit your trade at that point? Uh, well, in October 1990, I did. 
because I had had such a bruising elsewhere. But I, of course, kept my, uh, my mind open to more evidence coming in, which it duly did. Of course, I did not know that Maxwell was in a criminal conspiracy with Goldman Sachs. And, of course, that uh, was to go on and cause... Well, hang on a second. You, you defended Goldman Sachs a moment ago. I do, yes. But what they were engaged in a criminal conspiracy with, with Maxwell. Beyond any doubt. So, well, well how... Well, explain. Well, basically, Maxwell was entering into transactions in the market uh, with Goldman Sachs knowingly the counterparty and uh, they didn't stop him from doing it. Okay, so, so, so well, why are you defending Goldman Sachs then, if that's the sort of thing that they do? Because I hugely admire the intellectual domination and professionalism which Goldman Sachs bring to their work. And I'm not uh, given to criticising a chap who shows great intellectual domination. I put it to you, Simon, yeah. that you're a bit of a pirate and, and that you have the... the piratical instincts that, that yeah. some people might say I mean unfortunately there was a bit earlier um, that we recorded when, when my bloody sodding tape recorder um, bro- wasn't recording it because there's, yeah. there's a, a particular facet of the tape recorder I, have, I had to buy a new one which is why we're trying out this new equipment now <laughs> and I said to you okay um, when I was younger I used to think that the city was full of clever people doing doing clever things and making money through skills, special skills that mere mortals did not possess and that's why they got paid so much more and I said as I've got older I've come to the conclusion that actually a lot of what goes on in the city and on Wall Street is just borderline crooked and certainly people people creating very dodgy products and, and selling products that should never be sold and the example I gave was collateralized debt obligations. Yes. Um, which is just repackaging bad debt and selling it on to other people, isn't it? Well, if I may say so, yeah. it wasn't bad debt at the time it was sold. But many people, myself included at the time, said, that's not the sort of investment I personally would make. And you must remember that these collateralized debt obligations were packaged up under a prospectus. It's, it's not as though the vendor didn't say who he, she, or it was. Yeah. It's not as though the buyer didn't have the opportunity to take advice and or read the prospectus. And f- the greed that people engaged in simply caused them to make these very foolish investments. Okay, so you're saying caveat emptor, and, then, and that's where it begins. It has to be. It, all investments have to be approached on the basis of caveat emptor. Otherwise, you might have uh, state-registered nannies to to sit at your shoulder and and stop you from making mistakes. Okay, but imagine for a moment, I I mean, it would require a huge imaginative leap here, but imagine I was a socialist or even a Corbynista. Imagine, okay. Yes. So I've got, I've probably got blue hair. Maybe. Well, quite possibly. Quite possibly. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm of indeterminate gender. I'm gender, <laughs> I'm gender fluid. And I'm rabidly against the injustice of the current system. And I'm yeah. saying, hang on a second. Nurses are having to go to yes. food banks. I don't believe this for a moment, by the yes. way. But, but I'm, uh, this is what I believe because I'm a Corbynista. Yeah. Nurses are having to go at food banks. And nurses get paid, what? 25,000 a year, maybe? maybe. Perhaps not quite as much not, as that, okay, particularly okay. when they start. Okay, okay. Uh, nurses are getting paid 12,500 a year, let's yeah. say. Let, for I don't know, but I'll take a while. Meanwhile, in the city, somebody, somebody can leave his posho school and get a job at some, at some city firm and invent this product. And this product is, what it does, is it takes dodgy debt let's say yes and sells it on to gullible fools yes and so it's the equivalent of me going yes. to the pavement outside this house yes getting a lump of dog poo off the pavement yes covering it in chocolate and yes. saying this is the best swiss chocolate 
by the way, may contain, in the small print, buried yes. is, may contain traces of, of, of dog <laughs> excrement. Of dog, yeah, yeah. Ex- excrement. Yeah. Uh, and I'm relying on the fact that the people I'm selling it to don't really want to know that they, they can see the delicious chocolate on the outside. Yes. Well, is there not an argument that actually this is not a very good way of earning a living? Well, it, it, it clearly is a good way because <laughs> okay. it produces a lot of profit. I suppose the nurses who decided to stick with nursing yeah. have made the wrong career choice. But leaving that to say, <laughs> I like your style. Uh, yeah, you well, are, you, you are evil, can evil, aren't you? <laughs> but leaving that aside, yeah. I share your view that if you taking the long term view about developing your firm, yeah. you should not sell investments which you yourself know are poor quality investments in all probability in the long run. Yeah. And that there's no doubt that when this brouhaha emerged, what, 10 years ago, uh, Goldman Sachs and others uh, were criticised. I think they were criticised justly because in this life one shouldn't sell bad products or services. Yeah. However, they did it, and uh, along with lots of others, and uh, there it is. It's now time for society to stop and think about the consequences. Well, let, me, let me give you another example of, of why I think the vampire squid is evil. Um, we know, do we not, that Greece should never have been admitted yes. to the European yes. Union. Um, it, 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 I mean, it's never been admitted to the euro, rather. It really came into the eurozone uh, on, on, a, on false, a false, uh, false perspective. Yes. yes. Well, the, why? So why aren't people in prison for that? Because you think about the, the suffering. You think about the well. Uh, Greek uh, people let me stop you. Uh, uh, undoubtedly, Goldman Sachs drew their attention to the Greeks, Greek government's attention, to the fact that they could rewrite their accounts in terms of the rules. And the, they would have a, an economic advantage of misleading those who ran the Eurozone. And uh, therefore, Goldman Sachs are to be criticized. And I think there's something to be said for that. I think deliberately to advise one's client uh, to do something silly, it, that is immoral. But let's not have any doubts about this. It was the Greek government that went along with this lunacy. It's not as though the Greeks were so stupid that they were just led up the garden path by Goldman Sachs. That is not true. And I may add, those who were developing the Eurozone uh, were desperate to have Greece in the Eurozone at any price. So everyone was part of this conspiracy of... Yes. It was a conspiracy to deceive oneself, if I can put it that way. And I haven't any sympathy for people who conspire to deceive themselves. Yeah. You, just rewinding a second to your, your story about how you made money out of shorting Maxwell Communications. In the previous thing, which is, which is lost to history now because the tape recording died, um, <laughs> you made an interesting point, which I, which I thought was, is useful to our listener, just in case our beloved dear friend is trying to uh, forge a, a future career in, in, in trading. You said to me, that after you'd issued your note, yes, you the market went down and you you exited your I trade. closed my short. You closed yes. your short at a profit, and you anticipated the next move, which was that Maxwell would go. This is outrageous! <laughs> How dare you! I'm going to bring my lawyers and 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 yes. and, and and as a result, yes. the Maxwell Communications price went up for a while. Yes, it didn't did. It? it went up from about. One pound forty to around two pound seventy. That's a, that's so almost, yeah, it almost doubled. Yes, that's absolutely so. Um, this is, on, took about nine months, I may add. Okay, so it, it doubled on the basis of what? Bluster. Well, well, that's partly true, but it's also true that uh, the bankers had lent insane, insanely ahead of Maxwell's uh, stock. Uh, when they must have known, unless they were completely idiotic, 
that uh, Maxwell was manipulating the price upwards. Of course, what we did not then know was that Maxwell was conspiring with Goldman Sachs to force the price of Maxwell aye, aye. up. <laughs> well, they did, and it was all it all came out later when Sir John Cuckney went round the city tidying up the mess afterwards. Right. And there's no doubt that uh, Goldman Sachs would have had any amount of uh, doubts subsequently about their conduct. Uh, the chap who, the partner in Goldman Sachs who did this is dead now, and indeed long since dead. And I'm sure the agreements into which Maxwell entered with Goldman Sachs were put in a safe, and that safe is now at the bottom of the Hudson River. But the fact of the matter in remains that uh, it, it, Goldman Sachs assisted him in uh, cheating the market. Right. Of course, the day came when uh, Maxwell's consumption of cash across his personal affairs and with other so-called investments uh, ran out. And then the worst of all worst worlds happened which was that the price of Maxwell Communication Corporation started to descend, and Maxwell had no means of manipulating the price upwards. So the price went down and down, and as the price went down, the bankers said, now we would immediately want to have our money back, because we've got all these loans secured against your stock. And uh, Maxwell, of course, had no money. He'd run out of money. With the result that the bank has sold the stock down, which they held as collateral, which is fine, save in one respect. By their selling the stock down, they triggered more defaults on the margin <laughs> contract, with the result that Maxwell had to sell more and more stock to get uh, money raised somehow. And of course, as fast as he raised money that way, the stock kept on going down until the magic day came when the price was about £1.40, where I had first got heavily engaged, uh, getting on for a year before. It started to trickle down. And I remember saying to my wife, oh, there's one term school fees. Oh, it's two term school fees, <laughs> three term school fees, and we're off to the races. And of course, uh, it emerged uh, an hour or two later that Maxwell had jumped off the back of his boat in the middle of, was it the Mediterranean? Or was he out in the I Atlantic? Remember. I can't remember. A long time ago. Anyway, he jumped off and drowned himself. And uh, I made a quarter of a million pounds which was a useful sum then, in the light of my various commitments, and not least those school fees I was telling you about. Yeah. And uh, as a result, I knew that I had done something which in practice anybody could have done, provided they had the courage to believe in themselves. And I had shown that courage, and others did not show that courage. I made the money, they didn't. When the share price was at two pounds seventy, that was what that was its its top, was it roughly? Pretty well, yes. Did you manage to sell at the top, or were you? Did you? Yes, I did. I did start going to sell out more and more, and it was a very slow affair because Goldman Sachs would not let one borrow any money, any stock. I beg your pardon, they wouldn't let you borrow any stock from the market. The moment you were an hour or two late from delivering stock. Goldman, Goldman Sachs would buy you in. So it was very expensive. So how did you do it? I just said, I'm right. <laughs> and what? I will persist with it until I pull it off. I see. But because I, 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 this is another lesson about, about short selling, isn't it? That just because your instinct was right, that Maxwell was a crook, that his company was worthless and it was going to go down. Yes. Um, even then, as we know, as you've just described, the, the stock price went up dramatically. So you could have lost loads of money trying to bet against it at the yes. wrong moment. Yes. So but how, I, how did you know when, to, when, to, when, to, when your entry point was? Well, I didn't. I just guessed. 
and I thought that it was a good time to guess in favour of Shorty. So, have you seen that film, The Big Short? Yes, I have. And, I mean, wouldn't you love to have been one of those guys? Uh, yes, I would. Had I known how to do what they were doing in America, by God, I would have helped myself in spades. Yes. Uh, we'll talk about more of this in a moment. Um, you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special guest, <laughs> Simon Corkwell, a.k.a. Evil Knievel. Sonny Johnson brings her cutting-edge conservative commentary to Sirius XM Patriot every week on Sonny's Corner. I didn't learn conservatism from Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, or Mark Levin. No conservative showed up in my school, my neighborhood, or anywhere in my intellectual orbit. I got all my conservatives from my unknowing but conservative principle practicing family and hip-hop. Sunny's Corner, every Saturday at noon east on Breitbart News Saturday. Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to Delling Pool Podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special guest, Simon Corkwell, a.k.a. Evil Knievel. We're talking, we're talking markets. We're talking trading. Um, dear listener, this might go over your head, but I think, I think you could learn some, some cool shit here from, from, <laughs> uh, from, 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 from the master. Um, so, yes, I can see that short trading can be a very expensive business where you've got these these positions which are losing money hand over fist. Yes. And that was the case, was it not, also in that, that movie, The Big Short, yes. where these guys have said, no, the markets are going to go down, um, these mortgages are going to collapse, yes. and, and we know this. But a lot of their um, investors were saying... We, we're not sure we can trust you. We want to get our money out before you yes. put any more money in this mad bet. Yes. So it's quite a dangerous business to be in, shorting. Well, I turn it that round, and I'd say it's dangerous not to be in it. And, uh, for instance, the problem really arises in uh, judging the madness of crowds. This has been a problem for, hu- for hundreds of years in stock markets, and one just works on the assumption that one day the crowd will suddenly sober up and uh, use its common sense. And uh, these matters uh, are a matter of judgment. Uh, for instance, I think we've got a very interesting position coming along right at this moment with Tesla Motors in America. Oh, Tesla. I, isn't, that, isn't that the biggest short? <laughs> yes, I think so. I, I don't see that one can... It's remotely likely that one is wrong. But I don't doubt that the crowds have gone mad on this, and that, that doesn't, it doesn't stop them from being even more mad. So one has to be fairly cautious uh, over presuming to know on Tesla... And so I would say to your listeners, exercise caution here. Well, isn't it the old saying, the markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent? Yes, well, that, that was a, an expression of modesty. Was it Keynes who said that? I, I think Keynes was quite a good investor. I was a lousy economist, I'd say, given what he's done to the world since. No, no, no. He, he was a brilliant economist and a very shrewd investor, although I'm told that his accounts at uh, Buckmaster and Moore, who were then a very prominent firm of London stockbrokers, were very closely monitored as to how they were going at all times because Keynes's gambling uh, often ran ahead of what the partners regarded as judicious uh, exposure of the partnership's capital. Ah, OK. Mm. I, I want to go back to Tesla because this is, this is one of my grim fascinations as well in that... I'm I'm alive to both sides of the story that one reads that electric cars are the future, that self-drive yeah. cars are the future, and it's yeah. only a matter of time before yada, yada, yada. <laughs> and yet at the same time, one is aware of stuff like just how many electric charge points you'll need for, yes. um, over, over a short space of time for this mass conversion we're going to have from yes. petrol cars to to electric number one so so i don't think the conversion can be as quick as as the some pundits have predicted yeah. two there are market competitors it's not it tesla is not the only electric car manufacturer yes 
So, so what would you if you're if you're betting against? Well, I I, I know you're betting against Tellers because I've I've seen your short position. Yeah. Um, what's your what's your rationale for betting against Tesla? It's because the valuation, which is around fifty billion dollars as we speak, mm. uh, is insane. What people seem to be unable to accept is that. There are other car companies in the world, like General Motors, the Japanese motor car companies, Daimler-Benz, and these people are not fools. They have worked out that there is going to be money made out of electric motor vehicles, and they will move to profit by it. Indeed, only yesterday, Sir James Dyson announced that he would be going for an electric vehicle. Now, when really intelligent people like that say they're going to compete with Elon Musk at Tesla, who I think is grossly overrated, uh, the, the management of Tesla should be cautious. Or, put another way, I think the investors in Tesla should be cautious. There's big, big trouble coming on the way. You're, you are, of course, not the only person who thinks this way. I think, I think every week I look at my copy of Money Week yes. and there's a section on the 10 most shorted stocks. Yes. And I think Tesla is always something something like 13%, I think, of... Uh, perhaps more. Perhaps I perhaps don't more. know, yes. Um, how do they work out that by, by this percentage, by the way? About um, I don't know. It's not as though there's an automatic signal from the stock market... Uh, but uh, maybe there are returns in America, which I don't know about, which uh, companies have to make about the extent to which their share capital is shorted. Right. But there certainly is no such procedure here. Right. So um, you're not one of those traders who uses charts and stuff. It sounds like you, you, you use a sort of mixture of gut in- instinct, psychology, and close analysis of the... Um, of the accounts? Yes, yes. I always start with uh, an analysis of the balance sheet, uh, which some people don't do. Despite having not read economics at Cambridge, nevertheless you read a balance sheet. Well, I did articles as a, to become a chartered accountant when I was what was then Cooper Brothers and Co., which is now PwC. And whilst I don't claim to be the greatest accountant in the world, I can certainly read a balance sheet. And to me, the cover of tangible net assets is, is really important. And when I see piles of debt accumulating, and when I see piles of intangible stuffed on the balance sheet, I just think that's a warning. And many people don't take that view. But I do. So, okay, so um, there's one ingredient one needs to be a, um, a successful trader. A, yes. A sort of math skills? <laughs> well, this is not math skills. It's really just common sense. It's a sense of proportion. It's like betting on test cricket. You've got to have a sense of probability right. as events unfold within the time available. Right. And I've got that. And I may add, a lot of other people have got it as well. It's just that they uh, elect not to bring those skills to bear on their personal investment portfolios. How many how many trades do you make in a day? Oh, uh, I don't know, two three times a day. Right, and and you you're scanning the whole. You're looking at commodities. You're looking at yes. the horses. Yes. You're looking at um, what else? Well, certain certain yeah. businesses. If it moves, I trade it. Right. Yeah. Which is quite a... So, you, so you've got to have a sort of broad overview, like you listen to the, the news. And yes. You, I mean, is that, does that come into it as well, sort of judging the sort yes. of the mood in the atmosphere? Yes. I think it, that has a huge effect. Does it? Uh, for instance, uh, I know that people buy and sell through surges of emotion yeah. caused by the day's news and the, the news climate. And it's always, I say always, it's almost always right to oppose these surges of emotion. And I've taught myself to oppose that. 
It's not foolproof, but it's certainly very rewarding. So, for example, if some big disastrous news event yes. happens, yes. you think, aye, aye, this is a buying opportunity. Yes. And per contra, I think if people uh, are going ahead of events, uh, it's time to sell the stock. I mean, a very good example of that has occurred this week with a company called Boohoo, which you'll know about. It's based in Manchester, and it's capitalised at well over £2 billion. Pounds. Well, the amount of what I regard as solid assets, money in the bank account, is a tiny fraction of that two billion, and it's uh, currently rated. Uh, and I hasten to add, it's fallen twenty five percent in the last twenty four hours. So that's that short buggered then. No, well, I've well, I've made a short. I've made money. No, on but it. I mean, me or or, or well, dear, dear listener. On the contrary, I still think it's absurdly overvalued at one hundred and ninety five pence, and in due course, it'll go a lot lower. Mm. Now, the key to this is. One has to accept it's not going to go a lot lower tomorrow or next week. Right. But the market has been put on warning, uh, put on notice, that the punters will sell this stock. This is the first time this has happened, and I'd be very surprised if it's the last time, because the valuation bears no resemblance to probability. And um, in terms of your big short and obviously um, caveat emptor and, and all that yeah. is, have you got any particular recommendations other than Tesla no not really yeah. it's a question of timing and I don't like to be uh, prescriptive yeah also actually by the way people are going to be listening to this podcast at a range of range of time so so you're right it is time sensitive what about you know how the Queen said about yes. the previous crash why did no one see when it, see it coming? Yeah, and all the signs were there. What, yes, do, you, what, what was, do you think about this next it one? It seemed to me obvious that it was coming, and I go further. We're in the same position today. It is obvious that we're heading for another crash. Yeah. The reservation I have is one uh, on, of, on the timing. I just don't know it. But I would just mention that for some reason, I know not what, uh, October is a terrific month for the initiation of crashes. So right. we're only a few days away from Nirvana. And then I add the further point. If, however, the market does not crash in October, don't get short because November and December are typically tremendous bull markets. Oh, OK. <laughs> All right. So um, are, you, are you, you currently positioned for um, a nice position for a, for a big crash? Not as much as I should be, but that's because I'm now 70 and I have become a coward in my old age. Right. But you would presumably, to be positioned for a crash, you'd be long gold. Yes. Um, which you think, I mean, it's currently, what, about 1280? Something like that, yes. Um, what, where do you think it could go? Well, it can go anywhere. It's like bitcoins. Right. If the uh, population suddenly decides it has to have gold, yeah. it can go up $1,000. It could go up $2,000. That would be useful. Well, it, indeed, but well, the, fact, the, gold, fact, it, the fact is that you've got to keep an open mind yeah. and try and understand surges in value, or well, valuations, which strike you as irrational, i.e. the crowds are taking over. Now, we haven't got that at the moment, but I'm hoping... And I think there's a fair chance that uh, when the dollar crashes, because the debt position in America, the, the government's debt position there, is appalling. Yeah. And I think when that goes, then the dollar will decline in purchasing power sharply. And the contra to that will be a huge rise in the dollar-denominated price of gold. And... So where will the money go if it's if it's not in the dollar? Where, Swiss francs or sterling or, or, or what? Because aren't they all ropey? Yes, there's an element of that. Perhaps they go to Bitcoin. I don't know. Well, I don't know the timing of it. As yeah. you know, my bet is that Bitcoin is going higher. Yeah. But the reality is that you've just got to keep an open mind yeah. 
and see when you think the market is going mad. Right. It always does go mad. And on that note, um, completely ignore Simon's advice because it could get you very, very poor, or it could get you very, very rich. Yes, that is true, or at least I like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> You're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special guest, Simon Corkwell, the legendary short-selling trader, a.k.a. Evil Knievel. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>